Hi there, I'm Jesse, the founder of TrueLife.org, and we're here at Thomas Road Baptist Church to help show you how easy it is to evangelize and invite people with these TrueLife.org invitation cards. Hey, what's up, Jesse? Good to see you guys. Happy to be here. Thank you for coming. So we're encouraging evangelism and invitation in churches, not just Thomas Road Baptist Church, but your church as well. I'm sure your pastor probably gave you a TrueLife.org card today to hand out. And these cards are so unique because it takes the fear away from evangelism and invitation. That means that we don't have to be afraid of the questions that might be asked or the time that's going to take or not having a starting point. What if the recipient is afraid of going to church? Well, they can easily go online and get free video answers to questions like, how do we get the Bible? Why do bad things happen? Where do you go when you die? Does God love gay people? Is Mormonism true? Are Jehovah Witnesses right? And the list goes on and on for any worldview. And then, of course, they can easily find your church on the Church Finder. Hey, Will, so we're pulling up to a gas station right now, and all I need you to do is just go out and simply say, hey, I'd love to have you come to my church on Sunday. If you have any questions, you can go online and get video answers, okay? Okay. All right, here we go. <laughs> God bless you, I'm praying for you, okay? Let's see what happens. Hi, excuse me, how are you ladies doing? Good, how are you? Yeah, I don't know if you go to a church anywhere in the area, but I'd like to invite you to Thomas Road Church, see here. And, uh, and if you don't have any time to make it to church right yet, you can see on the back, uh, truelife.org, where you get free video answers to life's hard questions. And there's all kinds of different videos on there to answer questions people have, like, is there a God? And why do we suffer? And things like that. So awesome. take a look at it. Thank Remember you. the Lord loves you. Hey, well, do you feel better right now? I mean, do you feel relieved that, you know, at first you feel like a little bit... A little nervous at first, yeah. yeah. But now I know you, I'm, I've given opportunity to people to find answers in God's Word, and that's, that's exciting, you know? That's awesome. Well, you did a great job. And, and they seem to be very open to it. Sure. You know? Would you suggest the same for people watching? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Go out and do it. It's easy. Katrina, it's your turn. Oh, yes. We're gonna have some fun. Yes. You ready to do this? Yes. I'm We're a good go nose, through. though. You are, yeah. I'm a little nervous for you, too. I know you're gonna do well, though. Because yeah, um, so I've I'm, never I'm... done this before. I always <laughs> wanted to, but I'm nervous, but well, I'm, I'm gonna I'm do it. I'm praying for you, sister. I know you're gonna do fun. Here we are. This is good. Hey, you wanna talk? You can talk to her. Hi. How are you? Good. Yeah. This is, I would love to come, uh, you to come to my church next week. I don't go to church. I don't do it. You know, go to church. You know, you can go online too if you want to. Do you know? Yeah. Okay. God bless you. So we, what you do is you keep going. Okay? Yeah. And someone else, will, someone else will take the card. Yeah. Since she didn't want to. Mhm. Mm do you go to church? Mm, sometimes. Oh, great. That's good. So I would love to see you. I mean, come over to my church next week. And um, if you, for some reason, if you, if you, I mean, you're not ready, you can always go onto this website, like truelife.org, and uh, there are some free video answers. Okay. But there are a lot of questions we have sometimes, and there are a lot of videos explaining those questions, and you can always go and check those videos and have the answers. Okay. Yeah. Thank it's nice meeting you. Have a great day. God you best. too. Yeah. Hey, Will. Yeah. Man, we had a great time in there. Oh, yeah. Katrina surprised me. I mean, I, I knew she was going to do good, but she did really, really good. Thank you. <laughs> you did. Well, you know what happened? What happened? Uh, initially, there was um, one lady who didn't, um, you know, didn't want to take the card. Yeah. And she was like, no, I'm not going to come to church. And I was really, you know. <laughs> but then I didn't give up. Yeah. And he was with me. And we went on ahead. And we gave the cards to a lot of people. And surprisingly, it was really, it wasn't really hard, and no. they were really receptive, and I loved it, yeah. Yes, well, I'm so thankful that you just did my job. I don't have to explain nearly as much anymore to you back in the sanctuaries. We're not a different person than you. We are made in God's image just like you are, and every Christian has the opportunity to do this. And I can promise you from the bottom of my heart that there is nothing better than to share your faith with people. So I'm challenging you today, Share your faith, hand out these cards, and see what God can do in your life and in the lives of others. I'd be glad that you're in church this morning. Amen? 
You, you have the blessing to come to worship, to hear the word, to get some of the answers you're looking for, to be challenged in your faith, to find out what salvation's all about. You know, we live in a community, we live in a region where there are so many people that don't know what that's all about. This past week I had, um, we're preparing to move in a couple of weeks and so I was selling some stuff and I had this, this, this young couple, I mean 19 year old kids moved out here from California and, uh, and they were buying some of our stuff and, and, you know, and I just started asking them, said, so, so do you guys go to church? Have you guys found a church yet? And they're like, kind of looked at me like with this blank look on their face and stuff. And I'm like, do you guys go to church? And the guy goes, never. I'm like 19 years old, never been to church. They don't, it's not even a thought. Why would I go to church? The, 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 the girl that was with them said, I used to go to youth group sometimes for the fun stuff, and, uh, which is common and stuff. But I'm like, so I began talking to them. And, you know, they, don't, they, they live out in Longmont. So I began talking to them about one of our sister churches in Longmont because I realized they might not want to drive 18 miles to come here, although I did invite them here as well. And so I started just talking about, the, about you know, finding that place because sometimes in a culture that is, so unchurched anymore. We don't realize, because we go to church every week, we don't realize that there are so many people that don't even understand why, or why would I even bother going to church? And they don't know the same benefit that happens when we, like we come together as the body of Christ. And so even if it's not technically actually sharing Jesus quite yet, we're giving people an invitation to come to a place where they can find Jesus. I want to challenge you to utilize these things. We're going to talk a little bit more about them as we go on. But this morning... I want to share with you my vision and what God has put into my heart for this next year. You know, we started off last year with, with, with the words, love, give, serve. And that does not go away, that whole principle. And last year, we changed some of what we did as a church in our ministry. Instead of doing our own Easter event or Halloween event, we tried to partner up with what the city and the community was doing. We tried to say, encourage you as individuals to go out and find a place through the food bank or through a jail ministry or through at a nursing home to find a place to go and serve God in our community, wear a shirt with our church name on because you go in the name of Jesus in our church and just be light in your community and love, give, and serve in places in our city. And we have fed teachers. We've remembered them at the start of the school year. We've brought remembrances to our police department who went through a really tough year this past year. We went to the fire station. We did all kinds of different things. Some have been in nursing homes and other places. Our kids have gone out to nursing homes. And we've gone out to love, give, and serve in our community. And that's not going to stop. We want that to be part of our DNA as a church. And we're continuing to make that change of how we do things to be a part of who we are. But I believe that there's a next step. I don't believe that we just stay on one step, but there's a next plane for us to go to, a next, a next level that God wants to bring, bring us to. And the Lord's blessed us with getting our facility ready for what I believe God wants to do. We didn't do all this just to be comfortable. We did it to make way for multiple services. We did it to make way for, for small groups and, and for meeting the needs of people as they came to church. But now it's time to bring them in. Amen? Hmm. Thank you, front row. <laughs> now it's time to bring him in. Oh, pastor, that's your job. No, it's not. Can I tell you that right now? Not that I'm not going to do that too, but can I tell you, it's not my job to bring them in. In fact, Paul writes and says that pastors and teachers and prophets and evangelists, our job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. As an individual believer, it's my responsibility. As a pastor, it's my job to prepare you to do it. Matthew 5, 13 to 16, the words of Christ. You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. You see, God has called not just the church, not just a pastor. He has called believers, all believers are mandated to be salt to be light in our world, to go and make Jesus known. 
And just as we have the privilege to even come into a place where we can learn of Christ, one of the easiest things to do in that process of helping to be light and be salt is to invite people into a place where that's still happening. That doesn't negate the fact that we should be sharing our testimony and sharing our faith with other people, but it's a beginning point. Well, we gave you those cards because we want you to invite people. There's five, and there will be every week. There will be cards on every row, five at a time, because that's not for you to like split up and use over the year. That's for you to use every week, whether it's at the gas station or the grocery store, to look for opportunity to be can you say this word with me? Intentional. If you're not intentional, it'll never happen. To be intentional with reaching and asking people to come and hear about God. My vision for this year comes down to three more words, and I want to talk about them. They're up on that sign. Connection, compassion, and commission. It's the practical aspect of what I believe God wants us to do as a church this year. Last week, we talked about the feet and our feet. And if you saw any of my posts this week on Instagram or Facebook, I put a pair of really ugly, gnarly feet. I got asked if they were my feet. I want to let you know those were not my feet. <laughs> but then I put on there the scripture verse about how beautiful are the feet of them that bring good news. Spiritually, I think some of our feet have gotten very ugly because we failed to bring any good news to anybody. We failed to share Jesus. We failed to share, share the gospel of Christ. We failed to go out and invite people in. But we also mentioned about the armor of God. You know, the armor of God, one of the pieces of armor found in Ephesians 6.15 is for shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. What that is saying is that every Christian needs to put the shoes on their feet of the gospel, which is basically indicative of going with the gospel and telling others. It's part of our armor, Paul calls it, which means that if we're not sharing Christ, if we're not inviting others out to church, if we're not being a part of expanding the kingdom of God, then we're not fully clothed in the armor of God. And the reality of that is, if we're not fully clothed, we're open to defeat. And I wonder if the church has become a defeated place. I wonder if we stop believing for God to do miracles. I wonder if we stop believing for God to answer prayers. I wonder if we stop believing that God wants to reach people who don't know him because we have stopped going. We've stopped reaching out. We've stopped doing our part. We're not fully clothed with the armor. You see, we've lost our personal conviction. In fact, I went and I looked at Barna Research. Barna is a research group that, that investigates trends in the body of Christ in the church today. And since 1993 till now, there has been a threefold increase of Christians who do not believe that it's their responsibility to take the gospel to others. Even though that means that two-thirds believe it's their responsibility, we know that two-thirds of Christians might believe it's their responsibility to do it, but we all know that believing it's your responsibility and doing it are two different things. In fact, a lot of times we might believe it's our responsibility, but if the opportunity never presents itself to us, we never do anything about it. And then we're surprised when the opportunity comes to us and we say something and someone responds. We're so like elated like this is what's some big deal when it's something that should be occurring through our lives on a daily basis. But threefold, not only that, but a threefold increase and Christians who have come to the fact that it's not the individual believer, but it's the church's job to do it. Can I tell you something? You as the individual believer are the church. The church is not the building. The church is not the organizational structure. The church is every individual believer. The problem that happens is when we don't find that, find that need if we don't think that God has called us to individually share Jesus to expand the kingdom of God, then we cease to do it because even so many who even believe it don't do it. In fact, those who believe in doing it, we've stopped sharing Jesus and we just start sharing personal experience. We've stopped actually using the word of God and sharing with those outside the faith. 
I think part of that is because we don't believe that other people think the Word of God is real, so we don't use it. So we simply come from this personal place. In fact, many believers will not even share faith unless they are in a personal relationship, a friendship with somebody. But the problem with that is so often when we're in a relationship with another person, we don't want to damage that business relationship or that friendship or that romantic relationship or whatever kind of relationship it might be. We don't want to damage it or threaten it by sharing Jesus because we don't want to offend that relationship so then no one shares at all. The reality is using scripture, when we go to share with other people, when we actually use the word of God, the Bible says the word won't return void. That's the power of God to share with other people. We have been given a mandate to evangelize the lost. We have been given a mandate to reach lost people. It's the heartbeat of Christ. So with that in mind, let me share on these three areas this morning, on this connection, compassion, and commission, because God has called every one of us to be his hand extended and to actively advance his kingdom. Amen? Have a quiet amen. Amen? Amen. Let me start with this verse, Ephesians 5, 16. Paul says, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. We might know the verse as redeeming the time because the days are evil. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Who agrees the days are evil? Our world has become, our society is no longer Christian. The world around us People are growing up. There's two generations now that are growing up, not going to church, not believing in Christ, not having that Christian witness. There are now two generations that are growing up in godlessness. We are becoming what they call postmodern. And you can see that wickedness. Just look on, the other day I was on Denver 7's um, Facebook app and a story, and I'm reading the articles. I hate reading the articles because it just lets me realize how crazy our community is, and it's not about political things, but people literally hating Jesus, hating the Bible, hating Christians, because they're not Christian. But that should never stop us from going and trying to redeem the time, amen? So let's talk about connection. Connection. It all begins with connection. There are three kinds of connection that's important to the Christian. The first one should go without saying is that we need to be connected to Christ. Amen? Amen. Who's connected to Christ? You've got a connection with Jesus. You know, sometimes as Christians we come in and we struggle with connection to Christ. And we never go on to further connection because we struggle with connection to Christ. But part of the way we connect more with Christ is by using the other forms of connection as well, which I'll talk about in a minute. In John 15, 4, Jesus said, Remain in me, and I will remain in you, for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. In other words, you can't be productive in the kingdom of God if you're not in him. We have to first maintain relationship with Christ. Are we maintaining communion with God? Are we reading the Bible for ourselves? Are we praying to God for ourselves? Are we coming together as the body of Christ to be fed and to grow? Our second connection is our connection to each other. You've heard me say this one a lot of times, Hebrews 10, 25. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. You know, you can't look at our world today. You can't look at the earthquakes. You can't look at what's going on in the Middle East right now. You can look at it with all your political perspective that you want, but you know what? That just depresses me. What I look at it is and say, mm-hmm, we're getting closer to Jesus coming back. Uh Uh-huh, these things are part of prophecy that happen in those days before Christ returns. Yes, the love of many is going to wax cold. Yes, the heat, the the problems in the Middle East are going to stir up. Yes, Nathans are going to gather against Israel. They're going to persecute the church of Jesus Christ. And there's going to be the signs in the in the heavens and the earth and the moons and the and the stars. There's going to be all of the issues with the earth quaking and shaking. Poor Puerto Rico this week. Pray for these people. They've had four major earthquakes plus a bunch of other ones in one week. It's all a sign. It all reminds us that the earth is preparing for the return of Jesus. And what's the the admonishment that we're given in Scripture? To not neglect coming together as the body of Christ. In other words, we should do it even more 
Because we need to be there to encourage one another as the body of Christ, as we see the time of him coming back again soon. We need to be gathering together. We need to be building one another up. We need to be encouraging one another. Romans 14, 19 says, so then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. And Ephesians 4, 16 says, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. And in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, it says, So encourage each other and build each other up, just as you are already doing. You see, we're told not just to connect with Christ, but to connect with the body of Christ. Christ is the head. We are the individual parts of that body. And if we're not together, then we're disjointed. And if we're not together, the other problem is is that we are not being a place to invite others in. If we're not together strengthening one another, then we haven't laid the foundation for others to come and discover the love, the strength, the encouragement, the building up, the hope that comes from Christ through his church. And you know, people have gotten critical of the church so much, and they call the church judgmental, and you know what? We shouldn't be judgmental as a church. Can I encourage you to stay out of politics? It's like politics divides. Jesus unites. I, I, I get it. I got, po- I got political thoughts and opinions. I have frustrations. But politics divides. Jesus unites. They even politicized when Jesus was, I was reading in the Word this week. I read the book of Matthew, and I'm, I'm partway through the book of Mark right now. They even, when Jesus was, was, had been in the tomb and, and, and had risen from the dead, they even paid off the guards and bribed them to lie as politicians about things of the day to try and hide the fact that Jesus was risen from the dead. All that stuff is nothing new. Lying politicians is as old as time. So get off of those things and get focused on Jesus because the world doesn't need a Republican or a Democrat. They need Jesus. And when we connect with Christ and we connect with the body of Christ, whether that's through a life group, can I encourage you this year? Connect through a life group. If you don't get intentional about being with the body of Christ in fellowship and being built up with one another in encouragement, you're never going to experience that. You've got to make time for that. Get into a discipleship group. We're getting ready. We've got four great classes coming up in February. Get into the church services. Get connected beyond these things so we can be bound together as the body of Christ because it's preparing us and we're making preparation to receive the lost into our midst. You can't bring the lost into a place that's not prepared. It doesn't say that God is the one who brings the increase in the word. It doesn't say that God builds the kingdom. He's the one who builds the increase. He can't do that if we're not preparing ourselves. We've got to be made, we've got to make ourselves ready for what he wants to do. We have to gain, gain part of what God's vision is for us as a church because it's in preparing ourselves that we make a way for the lost to come in and receive. And, you know, let me say something about, about connecting with people. Don't wait for someone to connect with you. Seriously, out of the mouths of teenagers. Why does someone else have to work to be, why, why, why is it someone else's job to become friends with you? Why don't you become friends with them? Because we're all waiting for someone else to become friends with us. I, I, I heard someone say, well, no, 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 one's, no one's making friends with me at the church. I'm thinking, well, have you made yourself friendly? Do you sit there when someone comes up and says hi, do you just go hi? Or do you like engage? Or are you going up to somebody else? When my family moved to Colorado, we knew we were coming to a state where our family was, was either on the East Coast or on the West. We knew that we were going to be alone here. And of course, as a pastor, I'm going to engage with people in my church. But one of the things that my wife and I decided to do is that we said, we are going to make connections with other pastors. We're not going to wait for some other pastor to make friends with us. We're not going to wait for someone else to come up and, and invite us to go out to dinner or to invite us to go do something. We're going to make that. We have more friends now than we've ever had in our married life because we became intentional about making friends. And in that intentionality, the Lord's blessed us with some certain leadership roles with other pastors and different things and has given us, and you know, I wasn't going to be afraid of even going up. I went up to the, I went up to the pastor of one of the biggest churches in the state and said, hey, you want to do lunch? And I'm like, usually like pastor of the small church, we don't, you know. And this is when our church was a lot smaller. They, they don't do, we don't do that. It's like, oh, they're untouchable. That's one of my best friends. It's like we need to be intentional about that connection. Stop waiting for others to come to us and go to them. 
But that brings us to the third place of connection that's so vitally important that the church has abandoned, and that is connecting with the lost. Come on. Connecting with the lost. It's not optional. Say that. Say connecting with the lost is not optional. Connecting with the lost is not optional. It's not an option. And it's not even dependent on any other connection. We need to, and I'm not talking about connecting with the lost so we can party with them. Y'all hearing that? Jesus thinks that, people think because Jesus sat with the sinners and the tax collectors and the wine bibbers, he wasn't out getting drunk and hanging out and sleeping with the prostitutes. That's not what Christ was doing. He was intentionally hanging out with the sinners so he could teach them about the kingdom of God and bring them to faith. We need to be intentional with the lost, not to be partying with them, but we need to make intentional connection so they can come to faith. Intentional connection so they can come to know the hope and the truth and the peace of who Jesus is. And that's what God, it's not optional for the church. It's one of the reasons why we gave you a tool. So little, so simple, so easy. It's just like, hey, here's information about my church. I'd like you to invite you to come to my church this week. And sometimes we're so afraid because you know what people do anymore? They come up with, well, what does your church think about homosexuality? Or what does your church think about these Mormon people? Or what does your church say about creation? You know, and, and we understand we're not all biblical scholars to give that answer. So that's why the back of it has this truelife.org thing. This link is actually on our church's website. We, you can actually go right to this page on our church's website now. And you can preview the videos. And if you ever find something, I haven't watched every one of them. So if you ever find something that's doctrinally off, please let me know and I'll talk to them. But they said that they're very good about making sure they're not doctrinally off on these things. But you can say, go, go to this place and find answers. I might not be able to give you every answer, but, but, but here's a resource that you can go look on your own and get those answers. And that's why we put that there, because sometimes we're so afraid of the answers people will have. You can say, I might not know it, but I, I might be able to find it, or I can give you a resource where you can go find it from your smartphone. I mean, we actually did the one that they can just do the little app thing on the smartphone and get there, because 95% of people in the world have a smartphone anymore. Last week, we looked at these words from Romans 10, 15, and how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. You know, we need to give up the pedicure and start sharing Jesus. You want your feet to be beautiful? Share Jesus. Jesus is calling us to connect to the lost. And he says that the feet of those who go and bring good news, that's why there's a shoe on there. The feet of those who go, their feet are beautiful. In Matthew 28, 19, he says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He didn't say, wait for them to come to you. He said, go to them. He didn't say, just hang out if the opportunity arises. He's telling us to be intentional about going. That word go is an intentional statement. Go make that connection. In Philemon, verse 6, it says, That the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. God wants us to share our faith. God's given you a testimony. If you've never sinned and you've grown up in the church and you've never, well, you've, we've all sinned, but if you've never wandered out into the world and have this big, huge testimony, sometimes people think my testimony isn't powerful. You have the most powerful of all. That's my testimony. I didn't go out to the world. I didn't experience everything the world did because Jesus kept me from it. It wasn't that I wasn't tempted. It wasn't that I didn't have opportunity. It's not that I couldn't have done it. But because I had a love for Jesus, that the grace of Jesus kept me from experiencing the pain that could have been in my life. Others of you have walked through that pain. You've been in those situations. And God's brought you out of it. And your testimony is powerful to somebody else who needs to know the same hope. And don't forget that Jesus himself said in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. The church is not just about healthy nutrition for the Christian on Sunday morning. It's about being a hospital for the sick. It's about reaching the lost because Jesus is caught up and it, it, his heartbeat is for those who don't know him. And remember again one more verse from last week in 2 Corinthians 5.19. 
Sometimes we got to hear the verses a second time so they sink in. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us, he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. My vision for this year is that we would be a church fulfilling the biblical mandate to share the gospel. That we would be a church that just starts inviting people. You know, not everybody you invite is going to come. And some people, they're going to be like that one lady in the shop, in, in, in the supermarket, who's like, get away from me. I don't know. Not everybody's going to respond. Oh, well. Oh, well. If they want to reject it, they can reject it. Shake the dust off your feet, go to the next person. But you don't know when that person who's going to say, that's awesome, and when they show up in church because you invited them. You see, we don't think people are going to respond, so we stop doing anything about it. But we are called to be the salt and the light. In Romans 1.16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. Do we not share because we're, not, because we're ashamed of the gospel of Jesus? He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. So the first area of vision is that we would be a church that's connecting. Connecting to one another, connecting to Jesus Christ but also connecting with the lost and realizing we have an individual mandate to reach them. Let me go on. Compassion. Is there compassion in our hearts? Do we have compassion for those who are lost? William, I have a definition of compassion that I'm out of order, but would you just bring it up real quick? Compassion, it's a noun. Sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortune of others. Sympathetic pity and concern for the suffering or misfortune of others. But those people look like they got, this is the problem with America. Most people look like they got it all together. Most people don't look like they're suffering. Most people don't look like they're misfortunate. Can I tell you something today? They are so directionless. They are so lost. They are so bound in sin. People are so sexually perverse anymore. They are so bound by, by, by drugs and alcohol, even if they're not what we look at as an alcoholic or a drug addict. They're bound by materialism. They're bound. They've been lied to by the world. They believe the deceit of the enemy, and they're so bound up spiritually and so lost and confused. But they look like they got it going on, but they don't. And we've ceased to have compassion because we have forgotten that people are going to hell. Come on. You know, some singer dies from a drug overdose, and we're all like, oh, they're in heaven with Jesus now. No, they're not. They're burning in hell. <laughs> we don't want to think about our relative that died without Christ, that maybe they're burning in hell. So we don't want to think that they're burning in hell too. We don't want to be harsh and judgmental about other people. But if someone has not come to faith in Jesus Christ and they die, they are not in heaven. And the problem is the church has lost sight of that, so we don't look with pity or sympathy on anybody in this world thinking that they're all okay when they're going to hell. Can I just say something? We care more about koalas and kangaroos who got their toes burnt in a fire than we do about your next-door neighbor who's going to burn for eternity. That doesn't mean I don't have compassion for the koala and the kangaroo. They're fuzzy and cute. They're innocent because of someone else's stupidity. I get it. But animals don't have eternal souls. And people are more tied up and do more in efforts to try and help animals. And we should help animals in our environment. I believe that God has called, God says, God blesses people who take care of their livestock and their animals. That's, that's a godly thing, a biblical thing. But we're so caught up with saving the whales and this but we don't care that people are going to hell. Jesus cared about that. Now, I don't know about you, but when you marry somebody, that person's priorities start becoming your priorities. Usually that happens before you're even married. When we fall in love with someone and we are in a relationship with someone, we begin taking on things that are important to that person and priorities that matter to that person. That's why you see best friends sharing the same interests and doing the same things. If Jesus is our best friend, Shouldn't his number one interest become ours? 
Shouldn't his number one focus, shouldn't his number one heartbeat become ours? We're supposed to be the bride of Christ as the church. In John 3.16, it says, For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And in Matthew 9.36, we see Jesus it says, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. He was moved. He had sympathy, pity. Why? Because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. They were without direction. You know, as a church, our, one of our things that we have out even in the foyer, we've had it up on our platform, is a road. Because we believe that we are called to help people find direction for life. Not all roads lead to heaven. In fact, the majority of roads lead to hell. But we want people to find the right road that brings them to a destiny of eternal life with Jesus Christ in heaven, helping them to find direction for life, spiritually. When Jesus looked out at the crowd, he saw, here are a bunch of people, and they don't know where they're going. Oh, they might have known if they were going to the temple or to the baker or to the bread maker, but they didn't know where they were going spiritually. They were lost, even though they were the people of Israel. They were blinded by the things in this world, and their lives were filled with sin, and they were living in devastation. They needed to find the road, and Jesus was that road. He became the bridge with the cross. And I believe that this year, Christ wants you and I to become people of compassion. He wants us to feel the same heart that he has. He doesn't want us to just look out and see how lost the world is and go, oh, bless their hearts. Oh, isn't that so sad? They're just so lost. Oh, people are just so, they're just in such degradation. They're just going to hell. It's so sad. Well, that's going to do a whole lot of good. He wants us to be stirred to action to do something about it. You might be the only Jesus some will ever see. You might be the only person who will ever invite somebody to church. You don't know what's going to happen in somebody's life. You don't know when, 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 when you invite someone or talk to someone about Christ. You don't know what their next steps in their life are going to be or where it's going to take them. It doesn't matter if they're young or if they're old. People die all the time, unexpectedly. And what, to face eternity without Christ? And what if we were the ones who had the opportunity? I still remember almost a year ago when my daughter came down the stairs and she said, she said the ambulance was at the house across the street yesterday in the middle of the night. I know this neighbor. We had, she was in a wheelchair. One time she, her wheelchair kicked her out and we helped her get back up in the wheelchair, followed her home. We would help her sometimes with some different things. She also had another neighbor, a Christian neighbor, who took care of her yard work for her every week. There was a, a, a church in Frederick that would go up and, and would, would do her major yard work twice a year for her. But I knew this neighbor's viewpoints on things. She did not believe in God. She did not want to know anything about Jesus. She wanted nothing to do with Christianity. And yet God surrounded her with Christians so she could hear, so she could see. But you know that night when that ambulance came, she never made it to the morning. This week I was looking on Instagram. I'm trying to do the Instagram thing because Facebook is depressing. And so I thought I'll do Instagram. So I, I decided on all these, you know, these invites follow me on Instagram. I started looking through all my contacts, and I started seeing all these people in my contacts who were dead. You know, nobody cleaned up your contact when you're dead. I started realizing, well, this one's in heaven, but that one's not. This one's in heaven, but that one's not. And some of them I knew that I had shared Jesus with. Some of them I had known that at some point in our lives together, I had presented them and talked to them about what the truth of Christ was. And they rejected that that was their choice to do. But the reality is, when I stopped and thought about these people thinking that they weren't in heaven, it stirred my heart. Are our hearts stirred with compassion over those that we know that aren't serving Jesus? Because it's not religion. 
It's not just going to church. It's not just saying I believe in God. But it's someone who has a personal relationship with Christ. That's, that's what brings us into the throne room of God in our lives. Jesus was moved with compassion on all that he saw, all those who were affected by sin. In Mark 1, 40 to verse 42, it says, a man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus, begging to be healed. He said, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean, he said. And verse 41 says, moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. You know, Jesus' ministry was all about compassion for the lost and for those who are, who are bound up by the sinful things of this world. Do we have that same compassion? So part of my vision that God has spoken into my heart back a couple months ago was that not only does he want us to begin making connection with the lost, but he wants us to feel his heart for the lost. Matthew 5, 7, Jesus said, God blesses those who are merciful for they will be shown mercy. And in James 2, 8, it says, yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal laws found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then who can forget that parable of the Good Samaritan? It says, then the despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Let's not lull ourselves into sleep. Let's not lull ourselves and say that these people don't need pity, that they don't need help, that they're okay. Let's realize that what awaits that friend at school, what awaits that family member, what awaits that that. that uh, that coworker, or what awaits that person you just met at the gas station or in line at the supermarket? What awaits those people if they don't know Jesus is hell? And let that be a motivation to say, hey, you want to come to my church? I'd love to invite you to my church this week. We have an awesome church. Nothing to be embarrassed about in our church. Got good music, got good people, got good ministries, got a beautiful building. We got good stuff all around. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. We got truth going on in here. Let's get people to the truth. Let's have compassion. More than for the little koalas and the kangaroos. People's toes are already being burned on the tips of hell right now. Let's make sure their whole body doesn't fall in. Amen? And Jesus, you know what he promises in John 14, 12? He says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. In other words, he said that all the things, the miracles that Jesus said is available to the church today when we go out and we're reaching the lost. He said, you will do greater works than I did. You will do more than I did. And we look at the church and we don't see it. But you know why we don't see it? Because we don't have the shoes of the gospel of peace on our feet. Let's connect with the lost. Let's have compassion for the lost. And last, I'll be quick on this one. Let's know what the commission is. We need to have commission acceptance. We read this verse all the time, and people, like, in their spirits, oh, pastor's reading that verse to go again. I hate that verse. It means I got to do something. Matthew 28, 19 to 20, therefore go. But what does he say go and do? Make disciples of all the nations. It means of all people groups baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Connection deals with our willingness to endeavor to reach the lost. Compassion deals with our motivation for it. But commission deals with the dynamic of what it is to help the lost. It's not just to convert them. It's not just to get them to say a sinner's prayer. But it's to make disciples of them. It's to mentor them so they can become followers of Christ. It's not just conversion, but it's, it's helping people know what that relationship with Jesus is. And sometimes you're like, well, I teach Sunday school, or I teach a kid's church, or I, or I do that, so I'm discipling people. Yes, the ones who come into the church, but God wants us to also take the people who are lost and disciple them when they do come into the church. We need to be apart from be the beginning to the end in people's mentoring. What happens when you pray for someone who receives Jesus Christ? You're responsible then to help them grow in Jesus Christ. And you know what? We're so busy in our lives. We're so self-focused on our wants, our pleasure, our entertainment, our games, our goals. 
that we don't want to have to take the time to mentor someone to become a follower of Christ. But you know what? Your job, your entertainment, all of that stuff, it's all going to wither away and burn like grass when you get to heaven. The only thing that's going to remain is who did you bring to heaven with you? Who did we take to heaven with us? The Great Commission is about taking, going to the lost and bringing them to the point of living the life of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Helping them connect into those groups. Helping them connect into that class that's going to help their marriage. Helping them to connect in these very areas. Having enough compassion on them that they follow through with serving Jesus. So, I want to share with you my heartbeat of what I believe God wants us to do this year. It's not just love giving and serving in our community, but it's taking it to the next level. It's connecting. It's having compassion. It's fulfilling that commission. To connect with the lost, to make connections, to be intentional, to bring people to Christ. To have that compassion in our hearts, realizing that people are going to hell. I won't sugarcoat that. We need to wake up and smell the hellfire. We need to be aware that without Jesus, people aren't making it. And we need to accept Jesus' mandate to every individual believer to take his gospel to those who don't know it. To take his hope and his word. And to not just make a convert, but to bring them through in becoming disciples of Christ. So you had a chance to hear the word today. It wasn't an easy word. Sorry if I stomped on anybody's toes. Not really. I'm not really sorry. It's your pastor. It's my job to challenge you. Some days it's all about just beefing you up and encouraging you. And some days it's about really saying, hey, we have something to do. Because you know what? If you put on the shoes of the gospel of peace, I believe that if you fully armor yourself with the armor of God, wearing all of it, I don't know about you, but I can have an entire set of armor, but if I'm walking barefoot over Legos, it's going to hurt. You know what I'm saying? If I'm walking barefoot over the rocks, I'm going to stumble. What is the shoes? It's taking the gospel of peace. Let's get the full armor on, because then you are benefiting. And let me tell you, there's no greater joy than watching someone come into faith in Christ. I want to close with this one story that Jesus told. Jesus also told them in Matthew 22, verse 1. He told them other parables. He said, The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a king who prepared a great wedding feast for his son. We know that feast is going to be for Jesus. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to notify those who were invited. But those who were invited, it says, they refused to come. It was the house of Israel. So he sent other servants to tell them the feast has been prepared, the bulls and fat and cattle have been killed, and everything is ready. Dude, we're going to have like barbacoa tacos, you know what I'm saying? We're going we're gonna to have some good food going on here. Come to the banquet, he says in verse 4. But the guests he had invited ignored them and went their own way to his farm and another to his business. Wow, Jesus sets a big table and people are just too busy taking care of the cow on the farm, taking care of the business. Others seized his messengers and insulted them and killed them. The king was furious. He sent out his army to destroy the murderers and burn their town. And he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready and the guests I invited aren't worthy of the honor. Now go out to the street corners. And invite everyone you see. Did you hear that? Go out to the street corners and invite everyone you see. So the servants brought in everyone they could find, good and bad alike. And the banquet hall was filled with guests. He's not asking to bring in only good people. Bring in everyone. We are the servants. But when the king came in to meet the guests, he noticed a man who wasn't wearing the proper clothes for a wedding. Friend, he asked, how is it that you are here without wedding clothes? But the man had no reply. Then the king said to his aides, bind his hands and feet and throw them into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. And I said, that's kind of depressing, pastor. But here's the reality of it. 
God wants us to invite everyone. He has called us to invite everyone to the table. He's called us to invite everyone to the feast, good and bad alike. If they choose to not prepare themselves for the wedding feast properly, if they choose not to come in faith to Jesus Christ, if they choose to ignore the invitation that he gave and think that they're going to just get into heaven and still live their own ways, that's on them. Because many are called, but few are chosen. But those who have chosen to yield their, faith, yield their hearts to Jesus and come to faith in Christ because we invited them, well, we've just gained one more for the kingdom of God in heaven. It's our job to invite. Our job. Would you bow your heads with me?